Today, I'm joined by Jim Dawson to talk about data-driven compliance in pharma. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox, back for another episode, and I'm absolutely thrilled today to have Jim Dawson. Jim, first of all, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Jim, could you tell us your professional background and your current role? You want to go back that long, Tom? I've been in the business for a while. My background is I started out in sales, in pharmaceutical sales, went up through the sales and marketing group, was in the right place at the wrong time or the wrong place at the right time, I'm not sure which, and ended up in compliance, setting up the compliance program for a large multinational pharmaceutical company in the U.S., and then I set up their program, uh, did that for several years, and then decided I got tired of commuting and traveling as much and took a job with a smaller biotech company and set up their compliance program. So I did that the last 15 years of my career. And now I am working uh, with Core Data as their vice president of compliance solutions, which uh, basically says I'm their compliance expert, supposedly, and helping them develop their compliance solutions and advising on other compliance matters within the company. Jim, we are recording this episode for a podcast series entitled Data-Driven Compliance. And one of the things I was most intrigued about is your data has a data-driven compliance platform. So I was wondering if you can tell us a little bit about that and see how companies can utilize data to make their compliance programs better and equally importantly, a data-driven compliance platform to facilitate that use. Yeah, that's a great. Thanks for that lead in, Tom, because I think if you've been in the compliance arena for several years, you've realized that the DOJ and the OIG have increasingly said you need to know what's going on in with your own data, what's happening with your compliance program. And I think we all know they're really wanting to, us to answer two questions. One, have you identified the high risk and are they well uh, managed? And two, is your compliance program adequately resourced and designed, and is it working? And the only way you can prove that you have your risk well managed or your compliance program is with data. You got to be able to monitor and assess your compliance programs through a series of what I would look at is knowing what the key key processes that are going to say you have a risk managed well or not. So if you're looking at physician payments, you got need and you're worried about inappropriate payments to healthcare professionals, you need to monitor all the activities around your transfers of value. So are you your in-office meals, your speaker programs, your consulting agreements, all those need to be monitored to make sure they're adhering to your policies within the company and your compliance program. And at the same time, you're monitoring that you're not having any inappropriate payments being made that would lead you to a anti-kickback issue or a false claims piece that you may need to look at. So having said all that, data comes to the center of it and you need to be able to look at what's available to you. Can you see what your payments were to a physician over time? How many times have you utilized that physician? And at the same time, are they your high prescriber are they use, Are you giving them more business? Are they providing you more business that may appear to be a kickback issue? Those are the type of things you need to start looking at as a compliance officer relative worth. But the only way you know that is to get data. So you look at the prescribing data, you look at your payment data and activities to see, is there a corollary? That's an oversimplification, but that's where it starts. Let's just pick up with your last word there, starts. Because yep. you, you've described the detect component of a compliance program or compliance system. I'd like to ask you, can you then move to utilizing this data for a prevent uh, rather than simply detect? Meaning, can you analyze the data to see about potential weaknesses in either your program or internal controls? You, you Absolutely, Tom, because you have to sit down and say, start to look at your data to see if it, it's predictive. So you do a little predictive analytics to look at, do you see repeat behaviors? Do you see certain things that you can go then and put in potential controls to prevent that from happening going before? Or if you just simply, let me give you an easy one. 
just take your transparency, your CMS transparency reporting data. If you're looking at that data on a regular basis before you submit, you're collecting it, right? So you need to look at that to say, do I have a physician that's now meeting my internal policy cap of, let's say, $100,000, just throw out a number. I can monitor that as I'm going to make sure that physician never meets that $100,000 cap. That's preventing a problem. You can also look at to see, do I detect a sales rep that who has repeated problems with, uh, let's say, a meal violation? I can go out and start putting in place activities to say, why is that happening? Let's get to the root cause of it. And then by analyzing the data, I can put in the appropriate controls to prevent it from happening again or with other uh, salespeople. So you can always use the data, but you're trying to look at from a predictive standpoint to say, okay, is this going to, can I do something to keep it from happening again? Jim, there's a component of the core data platform that is uh, more applicable or even unique to pharmaceutical companies, and that is the state price transparency reporting. So if you're not in this space, you may not know what that is. Could you explain what that is and why it's significant for pharmaceutical companies? You're talking about Sputter? State transparency, you're better known as Sputter to a lot of people. And it's important because several of the states are asking companies to, or they have to report on price increases above a certain threshold. And that's based off of your products and the price increases you made over a certain piece, uh, over a certain price limit level or increase. And as a result, it takes a lot of data to support why that price was increased. You have to capture all the data and the penalties that go along with that can be significant. So companies need to have in place a good program to one, monitor their price increases to make sure they don't exceed the individual state thresholds for reporting the price increases and what's behind it. And then two is getting all the supporting data that goes in behind those price increases that some of the states are asking for. So it's a comprehensive uh, program that's a, that you need to be having in place. So I'm going to expand that out to a little bit broader than simply pharmaceuticals and basically ask, does this part of the program allow auditability and transparency should a regulator come knocking? I think you have to have, in every program you put in place, you have to be able to have auditability. So if a regulator comes in, it has to all be auditable with a good history and record, records retention piece of it and documentation all the way through. Jim, I also noticed on the company website that there were compliance services in addition to the software tool that we've talked about. Could you say a few words about the software services, excuse me, the compliance services Core Data can provide? Yeah, we work with uh, several law firms to provide legal services to help uh, advise on specific uh, legal matters that a company may be having around some of their data reporting for transparency. It may be around some of their HCP engagements uh, that are in place or anything around their compliance program. So we offer that as a, through a partnership with some of our legal firms that we work with. In addition, we are looking to, we haven't set it up yet, Tom, but we're in the process of, with the new emphasis within the CMS of doing audits. They're out now, going to do CMS audits for transparency. We're in the process of looking at putting in a audit readiness uh, to help companies be prepared for an audit that's coming forward. Jim, have you seen greater scrutiny over your, I don't want to say your entire career, but maybe the last 10 years around spending uh, for things like meals for doctors, speakers fees for doctors, other remuneration for doctors that traditionally have been utilized by pharmaceutical companies? I think if I look, if I go back over my career, especially in the last 10 years, Tom, I think there's been greater scrutiny on all payments to physicians or, and it's not just for me, it's not the in-office meals that, that, that I get more concerned with, even though we're looking at the scrutinies there, it's really any transfer of value to a physician. And if you, are watching and you're looking closely, 
The scrutiny is around knowing your data, knowing what your payments are. You need to know where your spends are better than the government does. So you better know your CMS data that you're submitting your open payments data or transparency data. You better know that pretty thoroughly and knowing where that those monies are going because that the government's looking at that and that scrutiny is there as well as all the payments to physicians. Uh, I can go back several years uh, and I'm going more than 10 when we were paying, I think, exorbitant amounts of money on consulting fees to physicians. You don't see that anymore because the government came in and has put in with the, the CIAs that have been put in the enforcement actions have taken has reduced the amount of payments we're giving to healthcare provisions. So I don't see that as much of a problem anymore. I think we've done a better job of managing the uh, in-office meals. Those have been in place. I still think the biggest area of scrutiny, in my opinion, is on speaker programs. It's pretty clear that they're scrutinizing those pretty closely and monitoring those. I think we're looking at charitable uh, giving is another area that uh, patient assistance programs. Those are under great strength. So payments in a lot of ways are being looked at, yeah, I think even under more scrutiny than they were before, different than what it was. Let me ask you a few questions about uh, patient assistance programs uh, because uh, they can certainly go wrong, but they can also go very right. So Correct. could you tell us what a patient assistant program is? What's the role of a company uh, as a charitable donor and how can a company protect itself yet still avail itself of this noteworthy goal? I think it's a, I want to keep it as simple as I can, Tom, because I think if you look at really what a patient assistance program should be is a pharmaceutical company is there to help patients who can't afford the product normally. And they should be giving charitable contributions to a, a patient assistance organization and it's truly a charitable contribution is you give the money, you let the organization run, and then it, and no information about who's getting it or why they're getting it. And you shouldn't be looking at any return on investment on that. It's truly to help. It, it should be a true uh, gift and go from there. I think where companies have gotten in trouble in the past is wanting to look at where that money was going and was it going to the right patients. And I think and trying to say, was there a return on that investment? And that's where you get in trouble. I think it's easier just to give, to sit down and say, here's a charitable uh, donation to help patients that, that can't afford the product. Now I'd like to turn to speaker programs and ask you if you give a few guidelines that companies should use when evaluating whether to pay a physician to speak. Should they look at the physician's text of his speech? Should they look at his professional background and specialization? Should they look at the conference? Is it all of the above or perhaps none of the above? I think, Tom, in my opinion, you look at the physician's qualifications. That's above and beyond where it really comes. To. What is that speaker's background? What is their academic credentials? Where have they been? Are they on major uh, organizational chairs? Are they lead scientific advisory boards? What are their credentials? And then from there, you also have to look at where, how are they compared or relative to other physicians in the, that are being utilized. You utilize all their criteria based on their professional fees. Where I tend to stay away from, and I recommend staying away from, is looking at where you're using them. I think it's better to base off what would be a fair market value to pay that individual for their levels of experience, their credentials, as opposed to what they're doing it for. You should pay them the same amount of money per hour, I would say, regardless of a bet. Jim, let me turn to conflicts of interest, but not conflicts of interest with a pharmaceutical company and physician. A conflict of interest for the employees of a pharmaceutical company who a vendor might want to entertain or send a gift to. Does the core data compliance solution help companies manage the internal conflict of interest? We really haven't looked at that, Tom. Kendra, but I think that is one that I'm very, I've been very conscious about in my whole career. I think that's one where companies get in trouble with their conflicts of interest in nice little relationships with vendor and 
and the people within the companies. And I've seen it happen. And I'm very one of those people that uh, think we need to do a better job of policing some of those relationships and, and talking about co uh, conflicts of interest that way. Uh, but we do not have a solution for that. Jim, as uh, we're recording this in late November of 2023, as we move towards the end of this year and into 2024, where do you mention CIAs, but do you see robust enforcement continuing under this administration or is enforcement in this arena really administration agnostic? I think you're going to see continued enforcement. I, I think that's always the case. I don't care what administration you're on. And I think the history has shown that whether it's a Republican or a Democratic or whomever administration, they're still doing the enforcement piece of that. I think that will continue. I think that we have to be concerned as compliance professionals of making sure we have the appropriate oversight, the appropriate controls in place, the appropriate monitoring, and to effectively make sure that we adhere to the appropriate guidelines that have been put forth by the DOJ and OIG, because the enforcement's not going to stop. You also mentioned a little bit earlier the False Claims Act. How can or how can a company really help facilitate internal communication with its employees so that an employee doesn't end up filing a false claims act? Does the Core Data Compliance Solution assist really in the helping uh, create a, a culture of speak up? I think uh, it's really we don't because we're more of a monitoring and looking at data solutions. But I think as part of an overall compliance program. I think you have to create that culture of, and looking at ways to get your message out, create that culture of speak up, making sure that people, when they see a potential violation or a potential concern, that they have a good venue or an avenue to uh, speak up and raise those concerns. But I do think you need to monitor what's coming in. You need to know what type of complaints or what type of concerns are be, being raised through your speak up program, making sure you're taking those appropriate remediations and actions, and then looking at your compliance program and improving that as you move forward. From a true core data perspective, we don't do the communications to help, but we are there to help monitor and check the activities you're doing to make sure you can take appropriate actions and then improve your communications going forward. Jim, unfortunately, we are near the end of our time for this episode. But before we leave, I wanted to ask you if our listeners wanted any information on yourself, on Core Data, or really any of the topics we touched on today, what might be the best place or places for them to go? Yeah, to the best ways to reach me is at jim.dawson at coredata.com, or you can reach the company at, at our website at coredata.com. Jim, I wanted to thank you again for taking the time to visit with me, and I hope we can continue this conversation. Sounds good, Tom. Thank you. All right, it's been a pleasure. This is Tom Fox again. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the award-winning Data-Driven Compliance. If you've enjoyed this episode, I hope you'll subscribe, rate, and review wherever great podcasts are listened to. I hope you'll join us next week where we conclude our 2023 season by visiting with Vince Walden from... Kona AI, and we're going to take a deep dive into the recent uh, talk by the Department of Justice at the ACI National FCPA Conference on the DOJ's use of data in FCPA enforcement and what it means for you as the compliance professional. I know you will enjoy our next episode.